Thank you. We will now restart proceedings. We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 67, and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Brian Whittle. So, President Officer, my app wouldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Whittle. That will be recorded. Point of order, Neil Bibby. Thank you, Mr Bibby. Your vote will be recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 67 in the name of Polly McNeill is yes 46, no 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 15 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with amendment 67. Maggie Chapman, to move or not move? Moved, presiding officer. The question is that amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 67. Maggie Chapman, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Graeme Day. Pause. If my device wouldn't work, I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Day. Your vote will be recorded. Point of order, Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer, my app didn't work. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Your vote will be recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 16 in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes 67, no 47. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 68 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 67. Katie Clark, to move or not move? I press Amendment 68, which has the support of organisations such as Cosley to the vote, the provision of justice social work and the cuts to justice social work budgets thank you, Ms. Clark, in greater we, scrutiny, thank you, Ms. Clark, we don't and I therefore urge members to support the amendment. Just the moving of the amendment. 
Um, so I call uh, the question is rather that Amendment 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Jamie Hepburn. Uh, I can't tell whether the vote went through. I would have voted uh, no. Uh, thank you, Mr Hepburn. Your vote was recorded. Point of order, Colin Smith. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Smith. Your vote will be recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 68 in the name of Katie Clark is yes, 51, no, 63. Uh, there were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to group two, entitlement to bail. I draw members' attention to the procedural information relating to this group as set out in the groupings. I point out that if amendment uh, number 22 is agreed to, I cannot call amendments 69, 70 or 71 due to a preemption. I call amendment 17 in the name of Janie Gre Jamie Green, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, Jamie Green, to move amendment 17 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Green. Uh, thank you and apologies to Labour for the preemptions in this group. I'll explain those shortly. Uh, amendments 22 and 23 in this group are uh, largely consequentials in relation to uh, the primary amendment, which is Amendment 17. Um, and apologies to members, this uh, contribution uh, is really the main one uh, of today uh, from my point of view, because it relates to the bail test, which is the uh, core of part one of this bill. I think whether we like it or not, and whatever your views on uh, governments using primary legislation to restrict parameters around the independent decision-making of the judiciary, the effect of this section of the bill is one which has caused, caused the most debate and, I think, consternation. I think I'd go as far as saying that it has, it has attracted, perhaps unusually, widespread criticism from both the judiciary itself and, at the other end of the spectrum, those who represent victims and their rights. As currently drafted, uh, it essentially limits the scope of a court's ability to refuse uh, an individual bail. At the moment, judges, as per the 1995 Act, have a list of criteria which they use to determine whether someone should be remanded or granted bail. This bill, this bill proposed by the government changes all of that. The new bail test requires that bail must be granted uh, only uh, if both of the following tests are met. The first, that the court deems that at least one of the criteria set out in section 23C of the original 95 Act, including, for example, things like the likelihood of absconding, risk of committing further offences, if granted bail, risk of interfering with witnesses, or otherwise obstruct the court of justice, sensible things that you would expect judges to consider. But secondly, now that the court must be satisfied that the accused should be refused bail in the interest of public safety, or to prevent significant risks of prejudice to the interests of justice. It is no longer an or scenario, it is now an and scenario, and that is an important difference. The so-called two-stage test that we've been referring to throughout this scrutiny process. And here is the problem with that. There are, I think, questions posed by the judiciary itself as to the properness of such a move by a government. 
There is a fundamental question here whether uh, ministers who, in my view, frequently rest on the laurels of the so-called independence of the judiciary when posed questions about such matters are very quick and keen to legislate on the other uh, that will narrow those decisions. There are a range of views as to the efficacy of this change in its entirety. Some stakeholders seem to hint that judges will just ignore it altogether, doing what they always do, making the sort of decisions that they think uh, is right and that they always make anyway. In fact, Lord Carloway stated that this bill, and I quote, introduces an unnecessary, cumbersome and artificial pro process without changing outcomes in bail decision making. That's extremely strong criticism from the highest judge in the land about changes to the bail test. And I think that should be ignored at our peril. There was also a, a huge amount of debate about what constitutes the second test, this new test, the public safety test. Some argued that it was too narrow, that it would effectively bind the hands of judges and severely limit their use of remand, even where it may be appropriate to do so. There was quite substantive arguments about how or even whether to define the issue of public safety. And what effect will this actually have in practice on remand decisions and remand numbers? So what is the compromise here? Well, so far from the government, the answer is there has been none. Yet the committee's stage one report said the factors that judges need to take into account would be preferable on the face of the bill. At stage two, I proposed a simple amendment which changed the and in this test process to the or, thereby allowing judges more scope to remand individuals who they believe pose a risk to the complainer or other individuals. That was rejected by the government, notably on a 4-4 split and on the casting hand of the convener. The parliament is split, the judiciary is split, and victims' organisations are split on this issue. That's why I brought it back today at stage three. Amendment 17 in my name replaces the and, again, of that two-stage process, but instead inserts five conditions of reasons through which a judge could remand someone, in addition to the so-called public safety test. At least one of the following criteria must also be met. One, the person is likely to breach bail conditions. Two, the person is likely to commit further offences whilst on bail. Three, the person is likely to abscond from court. Four, the person is likely to interfere with witnesses or obstruct the course of justice. And five, the court feels there is any other substantial factor that justifies keeping the person in custody. The fundamental question that the government was either unable to or unwilling to answer throughout this process is what is driving the Roman population in our prisons in the first place. Now, it must be a number of any of the following factors. Is it a result of the overuse or the wrong use of the bail test, the existing bail test, by sheriff or judges? It's a key question, but we saw no evidence of that. Is it perhaps due to the huge backlog in our courts, which is driving up the remand population, where many people are lingering in prison for months or, in some cases, years, whilst their trials are delayed uh, consistently? And we do have evidence for that, because Audit, Audit Scotland recently revealed that our backlog for solemn cases will not be cleared until at least March 2026. That's some three years away. Someone held on remand will be waiting their trial, and therefore their remand numbers will be higher. And the other question, I think, which is right to pose is, do we have a comparatively high remand population relative to the types of crimes those people are being remanded for? What do I mean by that? What is the proportion of people remanded, for example, for serious assault, attempted murder, sexual assaults, rape, and other serious organized criminal offenses, for example? And my point is, is this. Is it the profile of crime which has changed, which has resulted in the inevitable action of a judge having or feeling that they have to remand someone? Now, these, the Justice Committee struggled with these questions to get below the skin of this issue. And as far as I can see, Remand is already the option of last resort by sheriffs and judges. And that is perhaps why 8% of custody hearings in summary cases result in remand. 40% of solemn cases result in remand, largely due to the seriousness of those. If the system is not broken, I ask, why change the bail test? And that's not just a question from these benches. It's a question that the judiciary itself is asking the government 
to which the government has not replied. I'm happy to give way. Pauline McNeill. I appreciate the member giving way because it's particularly on this point. And since you mentioned the Lord President's, I think, 13-page letter, um, would the member agree that we put this very question to uh, both cabinet secretaries about this not appearing to have the confidence of the judiciary, who, as you say, uh, indicated this may make no practical difference to the outcomes. And I wonder if you would agree that the committee did not really get an answer to what is a 13-page full of substantial questions. Jamie Green. No, we did not. And disappointingly, neither did they come and give evidence to us. And I would really have liked to have heard from judges and sheriffs in front of the committee uh, at stage one as we gathered our stage one report. But nonetheless, they did produce a, an unusual 13-page letter, which we can't ignore. And it's not often that the most senior judge in Scotland would criticise a change to the law like this in such a way. And the government really has not replied. They either disagree with Lord Carloway, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with the Cabinet Secretary and the government having a different policy direction. But they weren't forthcoming with an answer to that. I don't think we should ignore those concerns. Because Pauline McNeill is absolutely right. The problem here is what effect will the bail test change have on the remand population? The answer is we do not know. It could go a number of ways. It could stay the same because judges will still use their own judgment and the bail test will make no difference, in which case the poly object, policy objective has failed at the first hurdle and therefore is unnecessary. The other option being that more people are released uh, into the community, which hitherto would have been remanded in custody. That may present a problem. That's perhaps why victims' organisations have a problem with it. And the opposite is that the definition of public safety could be so wide-ranging that it could be used in any scenario to remand someone to custody, and therefore more people may end up remanded. We've heard all scenarios. The government seems to not know what the outcome may be, nor has it done any modelling on that. And that's my concern. And that's why I'm seeking to insert the original bail test back into this legislation so that we are clear about the parameters that judges can use. The public safety test is so vague and so weak and so misunderstood. The original five condition test is clear and it's been used by judges, in my view, fairly. The government, I'm not sure, trust judges on this matter. I perhaps have more faith in them, and I urge members to support my own amendments in this group. Turning very briefly to other amendments in this important group. Uh, amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, um, I, I do support because it changes the wording of the public safety test some way to consider the protection of the complainer uh, from the risk of harm. It seems to be a technical change from the stage two, uh, which is welcome. Amendment 69 and 70 from Pauline McNeill. Uh, also add into the bail test uh, the ability for judges to refuse bail on the basis that the person has previously, for example, breached their bail conditions. Uh, because this is not in the existing test set out in the Criminal Procedure Act 95. Um, Amendment 71, it should be said, uh, also adds into the existing bail test a provision that allows bail to be refused if the court considers that there is a substantial risk that if any person might, if granted bail, might breach bail conditions. And Amendment 70 does something similar. Now, the reason these are important is that we do know there is, a, and I'll talk about this in a different group, um, a high volume of prisoners who do breach bail conditions. And there are many uh, though of those who are released on bail who are repetitive bail breachers. And the effect that that has on victims, particularly those domestic abuse victims, I think is quite horrific. And we've had first had evidence of that. Um, there are other amendments in this group that I won't speak to, but I'm keen to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say in response to the many criticisms that I've laid out in this group uh, that I propose. Thank you, Mr Green. I now call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 18 and other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I will speak to all amendments in this group. Amendment 72 in the name of Katie Clark removes the proposed new bail test from the bill in its entirety. A similar amendment was lodged by Ms Clark at stage two and was of course debated at the Criminal Justice Committee and I, I cannot support this amendment. Part one of the bill does not change the general entitlements to bail under section 23B of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. Under the new bail test, as is the case now, bail is to be granted to an accused person unless the court determines that there is good reason for refusing bail and that determination continues to involve a two-part test. The first part of the test remains the same. The court may only determine there is good reason for refusing bail where at least one of the grounds in section 23C1 of the 1995 Act applies. 
What the bill does, however, is narrow the second part of the test to provide that bail may be refused only if the court considers it necessary for one or two specific public interest reasons. The first is that it is necessary in the interests of public and victim safety. The second is that it is necessary to prevent a significant risk of prejudice to the interest of justice. So if an accused person does not present a threat to public and victim safety or to the delivery of justice, then bail should be the default. This new statutory limit on the use of remand is a direct response to calls made by the Criminal Justice Committee and others to take action to reduce the number of people being held on remand. If Katie Clark's Amendment 72 is agreed to, then the potential benefit of the new bail test and reducing the use of remand would be lost. And I ask members to vote against it. Amendments 17, 22 and 23 from Jamie Green would expand the circumstances when remand can be used by the court, not only under the framework envisaged by the new bail test in section two of the bill, but even in terms of the current system. And it is, of course, the job of Parliament to set legal parameters. The Scottish Government is seeking to do so, in this instance, via primary legislation. Mr Green and others are also seeking to do so via their amendments. But these amendments laid by Mr Green would represent a significant change in the operation of bail law, and there has been no consultation undertaken on the specific changes he proposes. Amendment 17 is the main amendment, with amendments 22 and 23 largely being consequential. A similar amendment by Jamie Green was lodged, debated and defeated at stage two. Amendment 17 separates the two requirements of the new bail test to make them alternative rather than cumulative. This would mean the court could remand an accused person either where one or more of the grounds listed in Jamie Green's Amendment 17 are established, or where there is a risk to public safety or a significant risk to prejudice to the interest of justice. The current bail test and the new bail test are two-part tests. By removing the need to satisfy both parts of the test, this change has potential to massively expand the court's ability to remand to massively expand the legal parameters. It would mean an accused person who poses no risk to public safety or who poses no risk to the delivery of justice could be remanded solely on the basis that at least one of the grounds listed in Amendment 17 applies. This includes the ground any other substantial factor which appears to the court to justify keeping the person in custody. This would give the court an extremely broad discretion to refuse bail for any reason that the court determined met the criteria of being a substantial factor, of course. Jim Green. Well, that precisely is the point of the amendment, uh, it is to give the courts that discretion. And the factors that are listed in my amendment, I think, are reasonable grounds. Um, the problem is that if someone is someone who does and has evidence of breaching bail conditions, who has previously uh, been released on bail and committed further offences, and there's evidence of such. Somebody who has absconded repeatedly or failed to attend a court diet and meet all of those criteria, but do not meet the new secondary test, the judge will be forced to again release that person on bail. So where is the discretion in that? Where is the fairness of that? All I'm trying to do is reinsert back into the system that the judges on the day are the best people to make that decision. It's not ministers here today. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I will come to the point about embedding the important principles in terms of the interests of justice, victim and public safety um, in, in a few moments. But the fundamental point is that Mr Green here today at stage three is proposing a massively, to massively expand the court's ability to remand. And th th that is a, a proposition that he has not consulted on. Whereas he may disagree with the government's proposal to, narrowly, uh, to narrow the statutory limits on remand. But we have at least consulted thoroughly and debated this matter thoroughly at stage one, at two, and now um, at stage three. Another uh, factor, presiding officer, with reference to Mr Green's Amendment 17, 
is that it also removes from the new bail test the requirement for at least one of the grounds specified in section 23c1 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 to apply, uh, to, to apply in order to justify refusal of bail and replace it uh, with a new set of grounds. And while the replacement of grounds in Amendment 17 are broadly similar to the grounds in section 23c1, a different threshold is set up for when each of the grounds apply, moving from substantial risk to likely. Exactly what the intent is in changing the threshold from substantial risk to likely is not immediately clear. If there had been scrutiny earlier of this change in wording, it could have been considered. But I would contend, presiding <coughs> officer, that stage three of an important bill is not the time to adjust a part of the bail law which has not been fully considered. Amendment 22 is largely consequential, uh, but it's not insignificant. And this is because while section 23C1 of the 1995 Act has largely been replicated in Mr Green's Amendment 17, section 23C2 has not been. So repealing section 23C would mean that the court would no longer be required to have regard to important factors set out in section 23C2 when making the bail decision, including the nature and level of seriousness of the offences before the court and the character and the antecedents of the accused person, including in particular their previous convictions. So exactly why the court should not have regard to these long-standing factors is unclear and in my view unwise. So, presiding officer, I ask members to vote against amendments 17, 22 and 23. Amendments 69, 70 and 71 by Pauline McNeill make changes to section 23C1 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. The effect of the amendments 69, 70 and 71 is to add two new grounds to the list in section 23C1 so that the court may cite one of these grounds as part of a determination to refuse bail. The two new grounds would be where the person has previously breached bail conditions or where there is any substantial risk that the person might, if granted bail, breach bail conditions. Presiding officer, while these are well intentioned, these amendments are not necessary and I will explain why. Firstly, breach of bail conditions is a separate criminal offence in its own right and any substantial risk that an accused person might, if released on bail, breach bail conditions is already covered by the existing ground for refusal of bail set out in section 23C1B. Amendment 70 is therefore not necessary and is already covered by existing bail law, which the bill does not change. Secondly, when considering the grounds upon which bail may be refused, existing section 23C2 already instructs the court to have regard to all material considerations, which include whether the person was subject to a bail order when the offences are alleged to have been committed, and the character and the antecedents of the person, including the nature of any previous convictions. This means the court is already required to have regard to whether a person has previously breached any conditions of bail when deciding if there is good reason to refuse bail in a given case, and so Amendment 71 is not necessary. As such, I ask Polly McNeill not to press Amendments 69, 70 and 71, and if she does, I ask members to vote against them. Katie Clark's Amendment 74 removes Section 4 from the Bill in its entirety, with the effect that the duties contained in it for the court to state certain reasons for its decision on bail and record its reasons when bail is refused would not be introduced. Again, an identical amendment was extensively debated uh, by the Criminal Justice Committee at stage two, though it was not pressed to a vote. This may be a consequential change to 72. However, section four has its own specific policy reasoning. The removal of section 4 would directly contradict the committee's stage 1 report recommendation that more information is collected about the reasons why remand is used. The importance of collecting more detailed data 
on the use of remand is something that was universally supported by those giving evidence to committee at stage one. And while I understand concerns were expressed at stage one about the potential burden uh, that the reporting duty was originally drafted would place on the courts, the bill was amended at stage two to reduce the amount of information the courts require to, to record and focus it more clearly on only, only the reasons why the court decided to remand the accused. It is this key set of information that we consider will be most useful in the coming years to understand the reasons why remand is imposed. I therefore ask Ms Clark not to press Amendment 74, but if she does, then I ask Chamber to vote against it. Finally, President Officer, Amendment 18 in my name is a minor and technical amendment to the new bail test being introduced by Section 22A of the Bill. It revises the limb of the new bill test that deals with public and victim safety so that the court may refuse bail if it considers it necessary to do so in the interests of public safety, including the protection of the complainer from risk of harm. This is a slight change from the original wording of this provision, which provided that the court may refuse bail if it considers it necessary to do so in the interests of public safety, including the safety of the complainer from harm. This minor revision does not change how this aspect of the bill test operates, but simply reflects that it's more natural to talk about protecting the complainer from a risk of harm. And for that reason, I ask Chamber to support Amendment 18. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call Pauline McNeill to speak to Amendment 69 and other amendments in the group. Ms McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I want to start with um, a similar point to the points that Jamie Green made, which is, I mean, in some senses, this debate is quite much the heart of part one of the bill, this discussion we're having now, because it, the basis of it is we had a bail test under the 95 Act. This is a completely new bail test. Now, I have to say from the outset, um, I mean, I don't envy the Cabinet Secretary's job taking this bill on. I, I mean that halfway through, but I, I, I'm going to say this in all genuineness. Try to get to the bottom of what the real purpose of the legislation is. Now, I noted down a phrase that the Cabinet Secretary used, I've not heard before, where she says the new statutory limit, a new statutory limit on the use of remand. Now, I, I, the government is going to have to be consistent to, to, for people to understand what this bill is attempting to do. Now, I will say from the outset, uh, for, for those who have not been involved in the scrutiny, it is a highly complex bill and a highly technical piece of legislation. I don't pretend to understand at all. What I'm trying to get is some clarity of purpose and some clarity on the new bail test. I say that I haven't heard that phrase before because the committee in its entirety had raised concerns about the use of, or, or, or the extent of remand and every time we asked is the purpose of the bill to reduce the remand population, we couldn't really get a clear answer. So I think the government needs to be clear, is this the purpose of this test or is it not? Now the test itself, and Jamie Green made these points in the letter, 13 page letter I referred to earlier, what the judiciary seem to be saying is that, it, 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 is that um, they've got some issues with the new test and they're not convinced it will make any real practical difference. And I think that's a problem in legislation. If you're taking on a new test, which the Cabinet Secretary has outlined very well, but it's unclear if it's actually going to make any difference. But furthermore, it could be complex for people to understand. Now, what I'm proposing to do in Amendment 69, 70, 71, as Jamie Green's attempting to do, I think, in one basis, is trying to put some prescription back in so get some clarity. I mean, one of the comments that was first made to me about it is that a bail test it does not specifically mention that someone who previously um, had uh, breached their bail wouldn't be included as a specific test. Now, I know it's not in Jamie Green's amendment, and Jamie Green's amendment also makes a slightly different test for mine, why I reference substantial risk. Jamie Green talks about the likelihood of, and these are important aspects of it as well. Section 2 of the bill seeks to change the grounds upon which a court may decide to refuse bail and amend 69, 70 and 71 allows the consideration of the risk of breach of bail. Um, now the Scottish Government might think these amendments that have said that they are not necessary uh, and, and I would accept that, that um, what has been said that the court can already consider under the new test uh, if there is substantial risk. 
My preference is just to make that clear on the face of the bill, um, that in fact the breach of bail should clearly be a ground for refusing bail. Uh, the Law Society said that a one-size-fits-all solution does not assist the court making proper judgments as to who or could not be trusted with being admitted to bail. And while the government is seeking to introduce a more focused use for remand, we must be careful um, that recalcitrant offenders are not continuously raised on bail without any consideration of the rights of the general public. Um, in the written response in stage one, the Scottish Government stated the new, the new bail test in the bill is intended to refocus how imprisonment is used to ensure as much as possible the use of custody for remand is the last resort. But I think it's important to note that that is already the case under the 95 Act. There is a presumption against the use of remand. So, it, it, again, it's seeking some clarity about what the purpose is of the bill. As the policy memorandum explains the purpose of the provisions uh, in the policy memorandum, it says to refocus the legal framework within which bail decisions are made by a criminal court so that the use of custody is limited to those who accuse persons uh, who pose a risk to public safety, which includes victim safety, or to when it is necessary to prevent a significant risk of prejudice to the interests of justice in a given case. So it is really important that, given the, the phrasing and the language of the new test is quite different from the 95 Act, that it's all, we all understood exactly what the Bill is intended to do. I conclude with this, presiding officer. It concerns me deeply that the, this provision in, in this part of the Bill does not yet appear to have the full confidence of the legal profession and the judiciary. I do admit the letter was written some time ago, but we haven't had an update since then, and I did ask this question. It would be helpful at some point to have some update on whether or not that any changes that have been made to this now have the confidence of the judiciary. And in that, I move and speak to my amendments. Thank you, Ms McNeill. I now call Katie Clark to speak to Amendment 72 and other amendments in the group. Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move Amendments 72 and 74 in my name, which have the effect of removing Sections 2 and 4 from the Bill. This essentially would maintain the current bail test, which in the vast majority of cases includes a presumption that the Court will grant bail. The approach that I am taking is similar but slightly different to that proposed by Jamie Green. Scotland, of course, has the highest numbers of people in prison in Europe and the highest remand rate. The figures provided to the Criminal Justice Committee are that almost 30 per cent of the male population are on remand and that on the women's estate, 37 per cent of women are remand prisoners. It has to be said that this is not because Scotland is a more violent country than comparable countries. Our contention is that these high remand rates are not due to the law or indeed the bail test that we are discussing, but due to a lack of robust alternatives to custody being available to the courts. It is clear that, in addition, decisions of this Parliament to extend time limits relating to criminal cases and perhaps culture may be other reasons. The impact of the pandemic clearly has put up the numbers of people being held on remand, but this is a historic issue with Scotland having extremely high remand figures. The Criminal Justice Committee first discussed this bill at our away day last August, and since then it has to be said we have taken extensive evidence on this bill. But we have been unable to find evidence as to how changing the current bail test from the public interest test to a public safety test will reduce the numbers of people being remanded. The current test has been in place for many decades and is settled law. What the Scottish Government is proposing is likely to make submissions to local sheriffs lengthier to increase the time taken to determine the issue of bail result in the same accused being detained unnecessarily while inquiries are carried out, produce more errors and increase the opportunity for appeals as well as adding to the heavy burden on sheriffs and therefore make the task who are tasked with the management of what can be extremely busy custody courts more difficult. Those are not my words, but the words of Lord Carloway, Scotland's senior judge, in his submission to the Scottish Government on behalf of judges. Polly McNeill and myself have spoken to dozens of practising lawyers 
about this proposed new bail test. And it seems clear to us that what the Scottish Government is proposing does not have the support of victims' organisations. It clearly doesn't seem to have the support of the judges. And from the discussions that we've had and the evidence that we've taken doesn't seem to have support in the legal profession. As I say, both Pauline McNeill and Jamie Green have already referred um, to the submission that I've just referred to, which said very clearly that the proposed new bill test introduces an unnecessary, cumbersome and artificial process, but it was difficult to see how the proposed new structure would make any practical difference to outcomes. So I think when we're scrutinising this bill, we need to look at whether the law will make it easier for the courts to make decisions and make the law more certain. And it's far from clear um, to see how the Scottish Government believe that changing the bail test in this way proposed will either reduce the remand population or indeed make it clearer to the courts what this Parliament intends. We believe that the focus instead should be on developing more robust forms of supervised bail and electronic monitoring. Amendment 74, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, is a consequential amendment to 72. It removes Section 4 of the Bill. However, it has to be said that during um, the evidence that we heard on the um, Bill, for, on the Criminal Justice Committee, um, Section 4 was opposed by victims' organisations as it fails to provide complainers with an explanation of why bail is granted. And it also has to be said, as we've heard already, that many parts of the legal profession um, are opposed to the proposals as outlined um, in Section 4. We believe that Section 4 is unnecessarily onerous and will extend the length of hearings. And on those basis, I urge um, the Chamber to support my amendments. Thank you, Ms. Clark. I now call on Jamie Green to wind up press of withdrawal amendment 17. Mr. Green. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank all members for their contributions? I know it's been a, a, a long group, but it is an important one. As Polly McNeill said, it gets to the heart of what the Bill is trying to do and what the Justice Committee has spent many, many months trying to unearth. I have a, just a number of, of brief comments in response to the Cabinet Secretary and other members. The first is that, which is it's still entirely unclear, even at the end of the Stage 3 debate on this section of the bill, what the government's real intention is. Uh, the government has not been up front at any stage in the proceedings and was given ample opportunity today to be clear to the chamber who have to vote on these amendments. Is it simply the government's intention that making this change to the bill test will result in a reduction in the number of people being remanded into custody? Because clearly that's what lies at the heart of it. If that is the policy intention, then say so. There's no point hiding behind modernisation and change for change sake. The government clearly has not listened to any of the criticisms made, not by politicians here today or at stage two, but by those out there who reflected and reacted to the publication of the bill. Lord, uh, the Lord President, in addition to the... Yeah, in one second, because I want to pose a question to the Cabinet Secretary as well. Um, the Lord President said the following of the change, and he said, that, and again, this is another quote for the official record, it is difficult to see how the proposed new structure will make any practical differences in outcomes. I stop the quote there. I will carry on in a second. Surely that's the whole point of what the government is trying to do, to make a practical difference to outcomes. But he doesn't seem to think so. I go on. The overarching test that bills to be granted, unless there's a good reason to refuse it, remains the same. The problem there is that that's a view that's also shared by the Crown. So it's not just the judiciary, it's not just judges, it's not just defence advocates and solicitors, but the Crown Prosecution Service itself gave evidence to the committee. And here's what they said. Different sheriff courts, or indeed different sheriffs within the same court, might take a different view on what public safety encompasses. The issue for me is that sheriffs could broaden the definition of public safety for other crimes in some jurisdictions, but not in others. That would lead to inconsistency confusion and ultimately inefficiency. Inconsistency, confusion, inefficiency, unnecessary, cumbersome and artificial. They are all the words of the judiciary and the Crown. Why are they all so wrong and the government all so right? I give way. Cabinet Secretary. 
President, officer, I think it's very important that um, members don't claim to represent the entire legal uh, profession. And can I um, say that the government has been absolutely uh, transparent, uh, even although I have come you know, relatively late into this process, in the, the th three um, of the reasons for uh, this part of the bill. It has been welcomed that we are seeking to simplify uh, bail legislation. That has been welcomed by the legal profession. And, you know, would Mr uh, Green perhaps also agree that embedding the focus on public safety, including victim safety and the interests in justice, in all cases uh, is imperatively important? And yes, uh, we are seeking to place statutory limits on the use of remand in the full knowledge in which we've all, I think, um, may well be in danger of agreeing that there are many factors uh, which will reduce uh, the remand population and that we do need to be looking at all the solutions. But it is disingenuous to come to this Parliament, complain about that, our high remand population and then seek not to take every opportunity that could at least play a part. Jimmy Green. Well, I mean, we've been really clear about how you deal with the remand population, get through the backlog and get through it more quickly. That will reduce the remand population massively massively, Cabinet Secretary, and you have the power to do that. Apologies through the Chair. Um, those, I'm not paraphrasing anyone in anything I've said this afternoon. I'm quoting directly words from the Lord President, Lord Carloway. I'm quoting directly from the Crown Office and Prosecution Service gave evidence. I'm quoting directly from Kate Wallace of Victim Support Scotland. No one has been misrepresented. They've been quoted, and there's a massive difference there, Cabinet Secretary. I'd ask Cabinet Secretary to reflect on that as well. And it's victims, really, that lie at the heart of this. And I think the last word on this should go to Victim Support Scotland, who have grave concerns about this new test that the government is introducing. It will be a concern to the public and the victims of crime that provisions relating to the bail narrows the court's discretion to refuse bail. The Cabinet Secretary has just uh, reinforced that message. And that is no doubt with the intention of reducing the prison population, Kate Wallace went on to say. The logic tells us is that more people will be put at risk there will, be more, there will be more victims of crime and more lives will be ruined. They, again, they are, no one's been misrepresented. No one's been misquoted. No one's been paraphrased. It's black and white in the stage one report, Cabinet Secretary. If you won't listen to us, if you won't listen to politicians, listen to victims. Can I confirm you're pressing the amendment, Mr. Green? I press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a vote, and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. <coughs> Point of order, Rachel Hamilton. Point of order, Rachel Hamilton. Yes, sir. I would have voted yes. My app wasn't working. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. I'll make sure that is recorded.
And the result of the vote on amendment number 17 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 47, no 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment 17. Cabinet Secretary, move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The uh, question is that amendment 19 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 67, um, Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. The uh, amendment is not moved. Um, I call amendment 20 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated uh, with amendment 67. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. Question is that amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a vote and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. Board of on Order, Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. I was unable to connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Carson. I'll make sure that is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 20 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 47, no 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Uh, I call amendment 21 in the name of Maggie Chapman. Already debated with amendment 67. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I call amendment 22 in the name of G Jamie Green. Already debated with amendment 17. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. The question is that uh, I call Amendment 69 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 17. Uh, Polly McNeill to move or not move? Yes, I'm moving, sorry. Yeah. The question is that Amendment 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division and members uh, should vote now. And the vote is closed. I would have voted no, but it wouldn't connect to the system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Gibson. I'll make sure that's recorded.
The result of the vote on amendment number 69 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes, 50, no, 63. There were no abstentions. That amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 70 in the name of Pauline McNeill. Already debated with amendment 17. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Move. Let's move. The question is that amendment 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Neil Bibby. Couldn't connect, President Officer. They voted yes. Thank you, Mr Bibby. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order, Paul McLennan. My, my vote didn't connect uh, either. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr McLennan. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order, David Torrance. I couldn't connect. I would have voted um, no. Point of order, David Torrance. Could you repeat that, please? Um, I couldn't connect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Torrance. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Next, I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I'll make sure that is recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 70 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes 49, no 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Call amendment 71 in the name of Pauline McNeill already debated with amendment 17. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? The question is that amendment uh, 71 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division. Members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. Point of order, Kenneth Gibson. Hey, I'm afraid I couldn't connect to the system. I would have voted no. Thank okay. you, Mr Gibson. I'll make sure that is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 71 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes, 50, no, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 72 in the name of Katie Clark. Already debated with amendment 17. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Moved. Mem uh, the question is that amendment 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now.
And the vote is now closed. <laughs> Point of order, Craig Hoy. I'm sorry, Deputy President, uh, Officer, my app froze. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Hoy. I'll make sure that's recorded. Point of order, Keith Brown. I no, sir, I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order, Jamie Green. Would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Green. I'll make sure that's recorded. Point of order, Richard Leonard. Uh, my app wouldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Perhaps repeat that with the microphone on. Sorry. Uh, my app didn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. I'll make sure that is recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 72 in the name of Katie Clark is yes 47, no 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not uh, agreed. We now move to group three, restriction on bail in certain solemn cases. I call amendment at 73 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Pauline McNeill uh, to move amendment 73 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Moving Amendment 73 in my name, report on bail in certain solemn uh, cases. This concerns a debate we had at stage two in relation to provision the bill uh, referred to as section 23D. Um, this is a similar amendment to uh, the one that Jamie Green will speak to. Uh, I moved a similar one at stage two. I want to go through the rationale uh, for it. Amendment 73 would remove Section 3. It would also add a requirement for Scottish Minister Carey to review all bail restrictions in solemn cases within 12 months of royal assent, considering what the effects has been of removing Section 23D. So the bill is introduced sought to repeal this section of the Criminal Procedure Act 1995, which restricts the granting of bail in certain solemn cases. Section 23D provides that bail is only to be granted in exceptional cases if the accused is being prosecuted under solemn procedure, so that's more serious cases, for a violent sexual or domestic abuse offence and has a previous conviction under solemn procedure for any such offence or drug trafficking uh, also uh, included in that provision. So the repeal of section 23D, the courts would simply instead apply the general rule rules that we've been discussing, the new bail test or the old bail test, when it happens in the end of the bill, but victims' organisations believe that the removal of 23D presents a serious risk to the safety of people and victims of gender-based abuse in particular. And for them, retaining 23D is a vital part of Scotland's commitment to eradicating violence against women and girls. The proposed grounds for refusing bail are not sufficient on their own in protecting people affected by crime and are an inadequate alternative to the additional safeguard within, contained within Section 23D of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act. The Faculty of Advocates are of the same view. Indeed, Sheriff Mackey, when speaking for the Howard League, supported the removal of 23D to allow discussion. So you can see that opinion is split on this. So on one hand, victims think it does one thing. On the other hand, oh. many practitioners are quite happy uh, to repeal it. Uh, I should say in conclusion about this particular section, uh, or, 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 uh, provision in 23D, it has a bit of a history um, because... It was discovered during the passage of, in fact, the scrutiny of the Domestic Abuse Act that provision 3.1 CA in that, where there's been previous uh, convictions for domestic abuse, that was only inserted in 2018, um, where all the other things I referred to were previously um, uh, contained in it. My initial was of the view that I did feel the court should have discretion as one witness said, well, if you had an offence 20 years previously, it does tie the hands of the sheriff because they'd need to apply this particular provision. But on the balance, I felt um, that that provision probably um, should be removed. And I'm certainly concerned that there is a difference of opinion about leaving in or taking it out. So uh, we don't really know what the inclusion of... Um, yeah, one of the things that puzzled me is having put this provision in on domestic abuse into 23D, 
uh, why the government takes something out we po only put in four years ago. So I I'm suggesting that the way to approach it is if we take that provision out, then it should be reported on. And in fact, arguably, we should report on it anyway because of this uh, division in, of opinion as to what it actually does. So keeping it and taking it out, I think we need some clarity about what impact it actually has. So that presiding officer, I move. Thank you, Mr McNeill. I now call Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 1 and other amendments in the group. Mr Green. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I'll speak long enough for folk to have a cup of tea, not, not rushing back uh, on this one. Uh, it's an important uh, group of amendments. I'm glad that uh, Pauline McNeill was able to open it, and I'll talk first about the other amendments in this group. Uh, I'm supportive of all the amendments in this group uh, for the following reasons. Uh, 73, in the name of Pauline McNeill, I think comes closest to mine, uh, and as such has my support. Um, it, she adds an additional review into the restrictions on bail and solemn cases. Um, however, my only concern is that uh, such reporting uh, would not go far enough, and, and that's why I will talk about mine and uh, my proposal in a second. I also support amendments in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, 63 and 36 particularly are welcome, uh, which seek to add a reporting requirement on the reasons for granting bail in certain solemn cases. I think that's a good step forward. However, I don't think they go uh, far uh, enough. Which leads me to my amendment, uh, amendment number one. It's amendment number one in name uh, and in nature because for me it's the most important amendment that I will bring to the chamber today. For me, it is very much uh, my red line in this bill, presiding officer. It's not just my red line, it's also the red line of many organisations and many victims that I've spoken to uh, over the past, uh, well, nine or so months as we've been scrutinising this bill. And I think even people with sympathies to many of the elements of the bill, whether you have, you know, sympathised with the government's intention around changes to the bill test, or even part two of the bill, which seeks to improve the through care of people and offenders after release. Now, there are aspects to that which I, too, have sympathy. The one piece of this bill which people have struggled with on a technical level uh, but also on a moral level, uh, and actually would struggle to support this bill at all, would be uh, the rejection of amendment number one. Uh, if my amendment, I think, is to be rejected, then I think this whole piece of legislation will fly in the face of every victim's organisation who gave evidence to the Justice Committee, uh, and who work frequently, not just with the Justice Committee, but who work with the government themselves on a wide range of proposals. People that we rely on, time after time, we quote them in the chamber, we quote them in committee, the government quotes them, opposition members quote them. They're over-quoted to an extent, but their voices are useful, uh, as they are imperative. My amendment is a simple one, and it's simple because it needs to be simple. It removes Section 3 from the bill in its entirety. And the reason for that approach is because Section 3 of the bill removes Section 23D from existing law. Let's be clear about what Section 23D does. Effectively, it states that a person should only be granted bail under solemn proceedings if there are exceptional circumstances justifying bail, which means that someone charged with a violent sexual or domestic abuse offence must only be granted bail in exceptional circumstances. Now, as Pauline McNeill said, this was not always a feature of our legal system, but it was rightly put into law to highlight the acute impact of violence against women and girls and how seriously the matter should be treated. I agree with the current law and I'm not the only one. Section 3, which seeks to remove 23D from the current law, is a controversial move by the government. I have to say uh, there are two schools of thought, members of the judiciary who practice law and who look after normally defendants, I have to say, and those who have suffered domestic abuse, assault, rape, and other serious crimes. And it's them who I will be listening to in this debate, and it is for them that I'm seeking uh, to amend the bill. Scottish Women's Aid, uh, who I haven't mentioned yet in today's debate, have very serious concerns about the removal of 23D. And the three quotes I will uh, give to the Chamber, I would really appreciate the Cabinet Secretary to reflect and respond to in her comments. Scottish Women's Aid tell us that far from adding, acting as a protection to victims, 
The proposal in the bill would effectively allow bail to be granted to convicted repeat and serial abusers of domestic abuse, including those who have perpetrated sexual assaults against women and who present a particular danger to women's safety. Uh, women need as much protection as the law can afford them, end quote. Rape Crisis Scotland uh, gave us commentary. They have significant concerns about the removal of what they see as an important safeguard. Uh, these were echoed by other organisations, Victim Support Scotland and Speak Out Survivors, who are a wonderful organisation who support victims of such abuse. And they said we have concerns about repealing Section 3 23D, because it was specifically intended to address violence against women and girls. Uh, we had plenty of other evidence to that ilk, and a number of individuals who also submitted uh, evidence to us of that nature as well. I know how strongly they therefore feel about it. Uh, in my view, if, and I think we have to be very careful with this section of the bill, if we choose not to remove section three of the bill, and we do remove Section 23D, it will have implications in the decision-making of judges in these types of cases. And I think that's something that is a, a grave responsibility on us today when voting. And I would ask the government to reflect on that. Because what I don't want, presiding officer, is if a result of voting against my amendment, we don't remove Section 3, and Section 23D is removed, and that safeguard is removed, safeguard perceived or otherwise is removed, then God forbid anything happens. If a judge under any other circumstances prior to this bill would hitherto remand someone into custody because of Section 23D but can no longer do so, what if that offender walks free from the courtroom and commits another horrific crime of domestic abuse or assault as warned by the victims' organisations ahead of today's debate? In my view, that would be an unforgivable outcome and one which we would need to look those victims in the eye and justify our decisions today. I'm comfortable with my decision-making today. My decision-making today is bringing forward an amendment uh, which safeguards and keeps that vital safeguard in our current law. Thank you. Thank you. I call Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment uh, 27 and other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. There are two amendments in this group that seek to retain the operation of the presumption in favour of remand contained in Section 23D of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. Amendment 1 from Jamie Green and Amendment 73 from Pauline McNeill. In addition, Amendment 73 would require a review of the operation of the restrictions on bail in solemn cases by the Scottish Ministers. Presiding officer, the policy content of the bill was first consulted upon in 2021. Uh, this was a full, open public consultation where anyone with an interest could offer views. Included within the consultation was a proposal to move towards one core bail test with public safety and victim safety at its heart. From the consultation, this bill was developed and introduced into Parliament more than a year ago for effective scrutiny to take place over the last 12 months. And this involved numerous evi evidence sessions eh, through the autumn by the committee, full stage one scrutiny and detailed stage two amendment sessions. So I would therefore, um, with respect, dispute uh, the need for further review of the operation um, of this aspect of bail law envisaged by Amendment 73, but I will come on to later talking about um, other reporting requirements uh, that the Government uh, will come forward with. President Officer, it, it seems to me that the key question Parliament is faced with in this group is whether to move to a single new bail test. A new bail test which has embedded within it public safety and victim safety. And these are exactly the issues that will arise in Section 23D cases where the court can use its expert judgment in assessing when remand should be imposed. If either Amendment 1 or Amendment 73 were agreed, it would mean that the current statutory restriction on bail contained in Section 23D would apply alongside the new bail test set out in Section 2 of the Bill. So, in effect, there would be two bail tests. The new bail test would operate uh, for most cases, while the Section 23D test would operate for certain, 
solemn cases. And it is, of course, important to remember that bail can be granted under 23D in exceptional circumstances. So, President Officer, I am very much aware through the process of scrutiny that concerns have been expressed about the removal of the statutory restriction on bail in these cases. It is important to note that these concerns have uh, tended overall to focus uh, less on a concern about the repeal of, that the repeal of Section 23D would lead to a change in bail decisions in these cases, but instead more on the perception that bail law is being weakened. And just for the record, uh, President Officer, I consider uh, matters of perception to be of fundamental importance, particularly in terms um, of trust and confidence. And again, I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. But we, we know that the, the issues in and around perceptions, that this is because most people, um, especially from the legal sector, uh, do accept that there will be no significant change uh, given the new bail test has, pre has protected the complainer from the risk of harm and public safety at its heart. However, I am aware from my own direct discussions with victim support organisations, including Victim Support Scotland and Scottish Women's Aid, that they would prefer the continuation of the statutory restriction on bail for this category of cases. So, President Officer, I do acknowledge uh, that these perceptions matter. Um, if the law is to be credible, it should command support from those who are affected by its operation. And that is why I have lodged amendments that will help us understand more and give reassurances on how the new bail test is being used in the future for cases that previously would have been subject to 23D. Amendments 27, 30, 31, 32, 33 and 35 in my name extend the reporting requirement in Section 5A of the Bill, which relates to Part 1 of the Bill on Bail and Remand. Amendment 27 will require information to be included on the number of bail orders made in respect of individuals accused of certain serious offences and where those individuals have a previous analogous uh, conviction. When the bill seeking to move, with the bill seeking to move to a single new bail test for all cases, requiring information to be reported on cases that previously would have been subject to the restriction on bail in Section 23D will help assess the operation of the new bail test for these cases. Amendments 32, 33 and 35 are consequential to Amendment 27 and simply define the type of offences which the specific reporting requirement covers. Section 5A also contains a general power for the Scottish Ministers to include in the report other appropriate information over and above that which is specifically listed. Amendment 30 adds to this to make clear that such information can, in particular, include information on the repeal of Section 23D of the 1995 Act, as provided for in Section 3 of the Bill. Where the report includes such information, Amendment 31 requires the Scottish Ministers to consult with certain groups when preparing the report. This includes consultation with persons who are providing support services to victims. Overall, these amendments strengthen the reporting requirements so that information will be available on how the new bail test operates for types of cases that previously would have been covered by Section 23D of the 1995 Act. Presiding officer, throughout the scrutiny process, there was strong support for the repeal of Section 23D from many, including the judiciary. The support was based on the law being simplified so that one core bail test can be used for all cases. And crucially, of course, public safety and the risk of harm to the victim is embedded in the new bail test. This is an essential element of the new bail test, which will continue to allow court to remand those who pose a risk to public or victim safety. And the new bail test caters explicitly for exactly the type of cases Section 23 currently covers. That is, where an accused person is charged with a serious sexual, violent or domestic abuse offence and has similar previous convictions. Exactly the type of case where public and victim safety will be of critical importance and exactly the type of case in which the new bail test provides for the court to refuse bail. Yes. Jimmy Green. 
I appreciate the uh, Cabinet Secretary taking my intervention. Uh, two points on that. Uh, I think the Cabinet Secretary used the words that there is strong support for the removal of 23D. I don't think that's the case. I think support was certainly coming from some quarters, but not all. In fact, it was quite split. In, in, and I sat through all those evidence sessions. I know that to be the case. So I'd ask the Government to reflect on that first of all. The second point, though, is around the new bail test, the single new bail test. Is the Cabinet Secretary confident and can give confidence to the many organisations who did voice concerns, that I, many, many of them I, I raised, but there are others, that she is comfortable that the new bail test will cover every scenario that 23D did previously and that no one, no one at all would be released where a judge felt that under the old system he, he would have preferred to have remanded that person given their risk to a victim or their families. And is that comfort, will that be followed up that in, in, as a result of any reporting that takes place as a result of these amendments, that the government, if it transpires uh, that it's not working and that people are committing further offences uh, whilst on remand, would the government then consider changing the law further, perhaps with the inclusion of 23D in future legislation? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I uh, of course always acknowledge that there is a, a range of views uh, and at the end of the day it's the, the job of government and parliament to, to balance views sometimes uh, at, particularly where there are uh, competing views and, 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 and views that are particularly uh, strong and uh, I would have hoped that members of the Justice Committee would have uh, now heard me often enough that I am very much um, uh, a believer that uh, policy should be led by the evidence and you know there has to be a purpose a purpose uh, to gather an information and it's not just to gather information to put it on a shelf it is of course to uh, vindicate and verify that a system is working and that if it's not it is of course beholden on us all to, to address that. I hope I've helped uh, Parliament today and Mr Green um, by putting on record uh, why I think, uh, why it's the view of the government that having an embedded uh, public safety victim safety test in all cases uh, would cover uh, those 23D uh, cases. Uh, but it's also my view that I think having one core bail test uh, is preferable to having two tests and that could of course lead to confusion uh, and will not in my view uh, assist with the uh, administration of uh, justice. Presiding officer, while not the main reason why the Scottish Government is opposing amendments 1 and 73, that there is um, also a real risk of confusion uh, under the law as the new bail test was designed to operate uh, as a single test of bail. So retaining a second test to operate alongside it uh, without having made the necessary adjustments to bail law, law could uh, lead to legal uncertainty. And it is for that reason that I ask members to support amendments 27, 30, 31, 32, 33 and 35 and reject amendments 1 and 73. Amendment 36 in my name introduces a new section into the bill. It places a new requirement on the court to state and record its reasons when a decision is made to grant bail in certain solemn cases. And I know that this has uh, the support of victim support organisations. The relevant cases will be those cases that are currently subject to a restriction on bail under section 23D, as members have debated extensively throughout the scrutiny process. Uh, there are conflicting views, as I've acknowledged, on the repeal of Section 23D with strong support or with support from repeal from many quarters such as the judiciary and the legal uh, sector, uh, whereas there is clearly opposition um, from others, uh, including victims' group. If Parliament approve, approves the repeal of Section 23D, the recording of reasons for bail in these cases uh, will support the reporting requirement uh, under Section 5A of the Bill by collecting information uh, over the length of the reporting period uh, for inclusion in the report to be published. Such information on those granted bail will help assess the operation of the new bail test uh, in an area of the Bill that has been contested and hopefully demonstrates that we are building in scrutiny from the start and greater transparency. Finally, Amendment 63 is a minor consequential amendment providing for the commencement of the new section being added by Amendment 36 on the day after Royal Assent. I would ask members to support Amendments 36 and 63. Thank you. And I call Polly McNeill to wind up. Press a withdrawal Amendment 73. Ms McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think that was a very useful debate. Um, 
one response I would like to make to the Cabinet Secretary in relation to it would provide two different bail tests. I mean, I thought about that, but, but this provision is for solemn, serious cases. I, I don't really see why you wouldn't necessarily... You might not find it desirable, but you could have a separate test for more serious cases, so I don't, I'm not persuaded by that. Um, I, I said from the very outset that, I mean, Jamie Green has always, from the beginning, been very, very particular about reasons for um, not keeping that in the provisions. I have been more divided on it because I did feel um, if, if there was an overuse of that and sheriffs and judges should be able to use the discretion, I was persuaded by that. Um, but I'm also persuaded I'm not really sure what real practical difference it would make um, to, take it, um, to take it out. But for that reason, I still think it's something it's worth reporting on, albeit had I more time to do it, I might have done it slightly differently on that basis. I'm going to move it. Uh, thank you, Ms McNeill. The question is that Amendment 73 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Shirley Ann Somerville. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, my app wouldn't connect, and I would have voted no. Thank you. I'll make sure that is recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 73 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes 46, no 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment number one in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 73. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. Question is that amendment one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division. Members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Neil Bibby. I think connect with the vote, yes. Uh, Mr Bibby, could we have that again? Matt didn't connect with the vote, yes. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order, Alexander Stewart. Not connecting with the vote, yes. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. I'll make sure that is recorded.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 1 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 45, no, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 23 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 17. Jamie Green to move or not move? So it's 23, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not moved. Not moved. Um, we now move to Group 4, Bail Decisions, Statement and Recording of Reasons. I call Amendment 5 in the name of Russell Finlay. Uh, group with Amendment 6, Russell Finlay to move Amendment 5 and speak to both amendments in the group. Mr Finlay. Uh, thank you. I move Amendment 5, uh, which with number 6 are the only two amendments in this group. As drafted, the Bill requires the Court to record bail determinations when it refuses bail. Uh, this is one-sided and, in my opinion, does not consider the interests of victims or the wider public. I believe a recurring theme in the justice system is that of transparency, or rather a lack of transparency. Too often, victims are left in the dark and left to fend for themselves. And they might well ask in the new bill why criminals, especially those with a history of violent or sexual offending, are granted bail. So amendments five and six will require a court to record the reasons for granting bail. So to recap, the bill as drafted will give accused criminals the right to know why they're remanded. So I can see no good reason why a victim should not be entitled to know why they are bailed. And amendment five will fix this oversight. Uh, amendment six would extend this transparency by making the right universal to everyone. Uh, journalists are the eyes and ears of the public, and due to commercial difficulties of the news media, fewer journalists are able to attend court cases, and consequently the public are increasingly deprived of information or left reliant on PR from public bodies who are primarily concerned with pushing their own agendas. Justice must be seen to be done, so members can vote for Amendment 6 to ensure the public are entitled to know why bail has been granted. But if this is unsuccessful, at least Amendment 5 would give that basic right to victims. And I would urge members to support both my amendments in this group. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, Amendment 5 in the name of Russell Finlay would require the court to state the grounds for granting of bail and have those grounds entered into the record of proceedings. Section 4 of the bill as introduced originally required the court to state and record the grounds and reasons relating to decisions to impose remand. At stage two, the Scottish Government responded to a committee stage one report recommend, recommendation by reducing the recording burden falling on the courts through section four of the bill. Amendment five would significantly increase the burden well beyond what the bill required even on introduction, let alone after the duty to record reasons was narrowed at stage two. This is because the vast majority of decisions in relation to bail result in bail being granted. So Amendment 5 would place an increased burden on the courts and a very large cross-section of cases entering the system. This may require further IT changes by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, as this is not information they are currently required to record, as well as add time to thousands and thousands of bail hearings a year. It should be noted there is an overarching legal presumption in favour of bail, which should only be refused where there are good reasons for doing so, as in such, as such in effect, bail is the default position. As I explained at stage two, when a similar amendment was debated, any requirements to provide reasons why bail has been granted could simply point to the legal requirement to do so and the absence of any good reason not to. Also, it should be noted that it is already a requirement under existing bail law that whenever the court grants or refuses bail, it must state its reasons for doing so. Therefore, the grounds for granting bail is information the court will already state in open court under this duty. And for these reasons, I would ask members eh, not to support Amendment 5. Amendment 6 would require the court to publish any grounds that require to be recorded under Section 4 of the Bill. Presiding officer, the 
information that, that is to be recorded is intended to be used to help develop a better understanding of why remand is used in Scotland. It is intended that this information will be anonymised and data will be available through statistical publications. However, it is not likely to be published by the court as Amendment 6 requires and instead would likely be done via Scottish Government statistics. Presiding officer, it, it may be that Mr Finlay considers the publication of information would be to assist individual victims to understand decisions made in cases specific to them. However, publishing case-specific information would raise potential data protection issues and given the late stage at which this has been proposed, we have not had the benefit of the Information Commissioner's Office input on the implications of this proposal. It is also through the Crown that victims can and do receive information about the court's decision on bail rather than publishing case-specific information. On the basis of this explanation and the fact that information that is recorded will be available through statistical publications in the future, I would ask members to oppose Amendment 6. Thank you. All right. Russell Finlay to wind up and press a withdraw Amendment 5. Mr Finlay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the Cabinet Secretary talks about reducing the burden on courts and if I understand it, uh, it still remains that remand decisions will be recorded according to the Bill despite the changes that were made at Stage 2. Um, we, we, it seems entirely reasonable and proportionate to therefore record the reasons for bail being granted. This is about equality between the rights of victims and complainers and I believe they should have the same right to information as has been, has been given to the accused. Uh, I also do not accept the Cabinet Secretary's uh, explanation about possible data protection issues. That sounds a, li a little bit weak to say the least. Uh, what goes on in courts, the decisions made by courts ought to be a matter of clear public record and it would be no great uh, hardship for the courts to make available to a member of the public or to a member of the media to seek the details of why a, a bail decision has been reached, but I will give away, yes. Cabinet Secretary. Sign off, sir. I wonder if Mr Finlay can advise the Chamber that when he was drafting and doing his research and thinking uh, with regards to these amendments, um, if he made an approach to the Information Commissioner's Office, because I would like to assure him that data protection uh, and the rule of law is not something that I have conjured up. And I also wonder if Mr Finlay would acknowledge uh, that the, the Crown have a responsibility to be informing victims uh, and victims can and do receive information via that route. Russell Finn. Yeah, I mean, I didn't use the phrase conjuring up. What I suggested was that the suggestion of, of GDPR or data protection didn't seem particularly fully explained by the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think the courts are well used to um, journalists and indeed members of the public having the, the in theory at least the right of access, the right to access this, this information and this principle, these amendments just extend that and formalise that right in quite an important area. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. Question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed.
And the result of the vote on Amendment Number 5 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes, 28, no, 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 6 in the name of Russell Finlay. Already debated with Amendment 5. Uh, Russell Finlay to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Um, I call Amendment 74 in the name of Katie Clark. Already debated with Amendment 17. Katie Clark to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment Number 74 in the name of Katie Clark is yes, 19, no, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We move to Group 5, provision of information about date of release from custody. Just to advise the Chamber um, that the intention would be um, to uh, get through this group, after which there will be a short comfort break, uh, particularly for the uh, participants um, in, the, uh, in the debate. With that, I call Amendment 75 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with Amendments 5, 85 and 989 and 90. Pauline McNeill uh, to move Amendment 75 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, presiding officer, for that good news. Um, amendment 75 inserts a new section which will require the Scottish ministers to take all reasonable steps to ensure that victims are made aware but when an accused person is admitted to bail as distinct from notification following release from prison after serving a sentence. A report published by the Scottish Government in February looked into the experience of families who have fallen victim to domestic abuse and female victims of domestic abuse told interviewers that the investigation, prosecution and sentencing for domestic abuse offences did not adequately reflect the sustained level of severity or impact of abuse uh, experience. And one woman told of her harrowing experience in the run-up to the court case. She said that the police sergeant phoned me the following afternoon to tell me that my abuser had been released on bail and that he was released about an hour to two hours ago and if I'm in the house, make sure I get out because he'll be there any minute. Over recent months, I've been meeting with people, I think we all have, who have had lived experience of the criminal justice system as victim complainers. And it is a very common aspect of victims' experiences that they're not notified um, of the release from either uh, remand uh, or in bail hearings and custody so that they can ensure that they can take whatever steps uh, necessary uh, to deal with that situation. A pair of cases where a perpetrator has been released on bail without the police informing the victim complaining of such a development, which has left them feeling vulnerable and at risk. Uh, this should also apply to bail appeals because people who are remanded to custody have the right to uh, appeal that decision. And so that would apply to that as well. So adding an amendment to ensure that a person against whom the offence is alleged to have been perpetrated is aware of the court's decision to grant bail would surely um, ensure the safety of victims of crime. So amendment 90, uh, Scottish Minister Mr Marcy, all reasonable steps to ensure that a person entitled to receive information under subsection 1 and is aware of the right to the information and given every opportunity to intimate that they wish to receive that information. Um, so again, I think it's one of these issues that goes to the heart of the bill, and it's the right of victims who come forward um, uh, and will obviously have their day in court. But prior to that, I think there possibly may be an omission 
um, in the in the bill in relation to the right of uh, victims and complainers to be aware um, where someone has been granted bail, uh, certainly in serious cases, um, as distinct from notification um, from those who are released from prison. Thank you very much. Thank you. Russell Finlay to speak to Amendment 9 and other amendments in the group. Um, I believe it's Amendment 8. No? Sorry. Did you say 9? Sorry. Yes, it's, it's number 9, Mr Finlay. Right. Apologies. Ah, apologies, yeah. Okay. So I've got two amendments in this group, uh, 9 and 89, despite my dodgy notes. Um, now, as in Group 4, these relate to uh, transparency. And while researching these amendments, I made a bit of a surprising discovery. It turns out that Section 16 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003 already gives crime victims the right to know when the person who committed a crime against them is released from prison. And this goes back to Cabinet Secretary's earlier comments about information being made available to victims from the Crown. But I would, I would bet with some confidence that most victims would have no idea of this entitlement, and I strongly suspect that they are rarely told about this. So this, this bill, I believe, presents an opportunity to put victims' rights front and centre, and indeed to extend them. So Section 16 of the 2003 law only allows victims to know about a perpetrator's release if they are serving 18 months or more. Um, so Amendment 89 would give all victims the right to know, no matter how long the sentence. So why should anyone who suffered from a serious crime resulting in a prison sentence be kept in the dark? So for clarity, Amendment 89 would give victims the right to know, no matter how long or short the sentence. Uh, that brings me back to my opening comments about transparency and indeed the earlier comments from Group 4 about the importance of journalists to the justice system. Amendment 9 would create a simple database which records prisoner release dates. When someone is sentenced, the public rightly expects to know details of the sentence. So surely it follows that people are also entitled to know how much time is actually served. The right to know is even more pertinent given the confusion about what prison sentences mean in reality. Yes, there is the victim notification scheme, but it's been acknowledged that that is not doing the job it should be doing. And yes, there has been some chinks in the opaque armour of the parole board, but accessing basic information can be complex, it can be confusing, and it can be conditional. A culture of secrecy around the justice system remains, and far too often the sentence which is stated by a judge and which ends up in the headlines has no bearing on the eventual reality of time served. The public are entitled to the truth and a public record of the duration of prison sentences is so basic, so fundamental, I find it odd that it's not already a matter of public record. I think these amendments represent an opportunity for a long overdue reform of Scottish, uh, the Scottish criminal justice system. And in that same spirit, I also support Pauline McNeill's amendments 75 and 90. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. The amendments in this group seek to place duties on the Scottish Ministers to provide information on bail and release and make changes to the Victim Notification Scheme, or the, the VNS. Amendment 75 by Polly McNeill seeks to amend the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 by inserting a new section 33A, which would require the Scottish ministers to take all reasonable steps to ensure that victims are made aware when an accused person is admitted to bail. Uh, while this is ve very well intentioned, I would like to say outside an officer why I'm asking uh, Ms McNeill not to press Amendment 75 today. 
Presiding officer, it is the duty of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to take all reasonable steps to ensure that victims are made aware when an accused person is admitted to bail, either proactively or in cases with no identified sensitivities upon request from the victim. It is, of course, the Crown Office that will have access to information and not Scottish ministers. When marking a case, the Crown Office have advised that prosecutors must refer certain cases to the victim information and advice team. In the normal course of events, a victim information advice referral it would be instructed when a case is being marked, but a referral can happen at any point during the lifetime of a case should the requirement for a VIA involvement it become apparent at a later stage. Certain categories of a case must be referred to VIA, such as any solemn case with identifiable victims, hate crime victims, domestic abuse victims and sexual offence victims. There is also general discretion for a, a legal member of staff to refer any case to VIA where they consider a victim would benefit from that service. The criteria for a VIA referral is therefore extremely broad. Where a case has VIA involvement, this will mean the victim named in the charge and any witnesses listed in any relevant bail order would be notified by telephone, followed up in writing that an accused person has been released on bail and, in, and if any additional bail conditions are imposed. This would usually happen within 24 hours of the case calling in court. For any non-VIA cases where the victim or witness has not been assessed as requiring VIA involvement, the victim or witness may contact the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service Inquiry Point Team or the local Procurator Fiscal Office directly to ask about the bail status of the accused and any relevant bail conditions. This can be done at any time. So, President Officer, give... Uh, uh, yes, of course. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful uh, to the Cabinet Secretary, and I do recognise uh, uh, the system that she's, she's describing there. But I have a con constituent uh, who was um, uh, allegedly raped. Uh, the member the, that, that her alleged perpetrator was then arrested and taken to, and, and uh, held in custody, and then given bail. And she only found out when she walked into him in the supermarket. Now, I, I do accept that the rules state that she should have been. Uh, uh, she should have been told. However, in, in reality, that's not happening in many, many cases. So how can, how can we in this chamber then uh, um, make sure that that doesn't happen again uh, if, we don't, uh, uh, if we don't promote Polly McNeill's amendments? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I, I very much appreciate the information that uh, Mr Whittle has shared on behalf of his constituent in, in chamber today. It's clearly um, unacceptable. Um, I suppose that the point that I'm making to, to, to Ms McNeill is that um, the, the, the endeavours, the purpose of her um, amendment uh, act actually in effect already exists, but perhaps in more detail in law. But of course the member points to issues of practice uh, and the events that he describes are of course unacceptable. I'm quite sure that he will be pursuing that vigorously on behalf of his constituent. And if he wishes to keep me informed, um, I would be more than happy uh, to, to receive any further information or communication from him. Um, Signing officer, just, just in summary to uh, Ms McNeill's uh, Amendment 75, given the approach that I've described taken by the Crown Office, it should be taken by the Crown Office through the operation of the Victim Information and Advice Service and the fact that any victim not covered uh, by VIE can ask the Crown for this information at any time. I would ask Ms McNeill not to press Amendment 75. If she does, I would ask members to vote uh, against it. Signing officer, Amendment 9, in the name of Russell Finlay, would place a requirement on the Scottish ministers to publish a database containing information about the release date or the expected release date of everyone in custody. I cannot support this amendment as I have significant concerns that this amendment would place ministers in potential breach of data protection requirements and the European Convention on Human Rights. This amendment potentially interferes with a prisoner's Article 8 rights, the right to a private life, and more seriously, potentially their Article 2 and 3 rights, the right to life and the prohibition on inhumane or degrading treatment. Yes. Russell Finlay. 
Speaker, and we have Mr Finlay's microphone, Sorry. please. Just uh, curious if the Cabinet Secretary could perhaps expand on the specific issues of GDPR or data protection that she refers to. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm sure I don't need to give Mr Finlay a lecture on GDPR or the importance of the European Convention on Human Rights, but it may be more useful to Mr Finlay, uh, our indeed Chamber, if I give a practical example um, of how his uh, proposition detailed in Amendment 9 could put people at risk. Say, for example, there was a woman in the female estate who was at significant risk of further abuse uh, from her partner or ex-partner. If ministers were to publish her release date, it would make that information freely available to the person who intends to harm her, who could simply wait outside the establishment she was held in on her published release date, and the Scottish ministers would have provided him with that information. And to be frank, President Officer, this is not a risk that I am willing to take. And while I appreciate that the motivation behind this amendment is not to cause harm in the way that I have described, but it is a possible outcome. And if Mr Finlay's amendment is intended to ensure that victims have more information about the prisoner's release date, then the Victim Notification Scheme provides that route. And we are, of course, extending access to information about prisoners' release eh, to victim support organisations under Section 11 of this Bill. It is for those reasons that I ask Mr Finlay not to move Amendment 9, and if he does, I would strongly recommend members vote against it. Turning to Amendment 89, also in the name of Russell Finlay, this amendment would amend the Victim Notification Scheme for victims of prisoners serving sentences of 18 months or more by removing this threshold of 18 months. This means that the, the remit of this scheme would be extended so that every victim where the perpetrator had received a sentence of imprisonment would be eligible regardless of the sentence length of uh, the perpetrator. However, there is already a branch of the Victim Notification Scheme for victims of prisoners serving sentences of less than 18 months, which was brought in by the Victims' Rights Scotland Regulations 2015. Those regulations inserted Section 27A into the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 which has been enforced since 2015. Section 11 of the Bill builds on this by adding new Section 27B into the 2004 Act to give victim support organisations the right to information about the release of these prisoners too. The information provided to victims under two branches of the VNS differs slightly as it is appropriate for more detailed information to be available for longer sentences, which are usually imposed for more serious offences. However, information in relation to prisoner release and where applicable licence conditions imposed for the purpose of protecting the victim are shared under both branches of the scheme. And in terms of the, the review that's just been undertaken into the victim's no notification scheme, uh, Mr Finlay might be interested in recommendation 15, uh, which makes um, comments on uh, some potential improvements uh, in and around information around short-term prisoners and their release. Given that this amendment officer, would result in two simultaneously but different schemes applying to prisoners serving less than 18 months, it is not clear how these two schemes would operate or interact with each other, and the amendment seems likely to bring a significant degree of chaos to the process. And I am concerned about the impact that this could have, uh, have on victims. It is crucial that they can be certain about their entitlement to information Unfortunately, this amendment simply won't do that, and I'm sure that Chamber will agree that we cannot legislate in a way that will undermine victims' rights rather than enhancing them. Furthermore, such a substantial change to the VNS process requires proper scrutiny, including consideration of the views of victims rather than being brought in at stage three of this bill. This is also, as I've said, a matter of the independent review of the victim notification scheme and the recommendations contained in its report to consider. I do not think it's appropriate to preempt any changes to the VNS at this stage, given the need to collaborate with partners and victims organisations on the VNS review recommendations and the possibility of changes to the scheme in the future. The Scottish Government is working with these partners as a matter of priority to develop a response to the report, which we will publish as soon as we can. 
I understand the appetite to make changes to the victim notification scheme, but I would ask Mr Finlay not to move Amendment 89 and to engage with the work. Uh, uh, yes. Russell Finlay. Yeah, just to be completely clear, I think the Cabinet Secretary is suggesting that the review of ENS and the general direction of travel is that this information relating to Amendment 89 will be forthcoming. Is that indeed the case? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the government is still to formally uh, respond to the independent uh, review on the victim notification scheme. Uh, what I am doing is I am pointing to the importance of not uh, cutting through that work. But I do think uh, that the findings uh, of that independent review will be of interest to Mr Finlay. And furthermore, uh, what I have also pointed out to Mr Finlay, presiding officer, is that there is already a scheme uh, for uh, those uh, victims where the perpetrator is serving less than 18 months in existence. Um, and, of course, the purpose of the VNS review is to uh, improve that further. So I do, presiding officer, understand the appetite uh, to make changes to the VNS, but I would ask Mr Finlay not to move Amendment 89 and to engage with the work coming out of the VNS review at the appropriate time. Turning now to Amendment 90, in the name of Pauline McNeill, this amendment would place a requirement on the Scottish Ministers to ensure that all victims eligible to receive information under the VNS are made aware of their rights to receive information and given every opportunity to intimate whether they want to receive the information. Currently, it is the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service who bring the VNS to the attention of eligible victims after sentencing. Requiring the Scottish Ministers to be involved in this process would be a significant change, uh, requiring detailed scrutiny and collaboration with partners, particularly in relation to uh, data sharing. I also notice that this amendment only seeks to make changes to the VNS for victims of prisoners serving 18 months or more, and there is no comparable amendment in relation to the scheme for those serving uh, under 18 months. As with Amendment 89, I think the amendment potentially cuts across the recommendations of the VNS review, and as such, uh, I don't think it's appropriate to be included uh, in the bill at this uh, late stage uh, without the chance to give it the, the scrutiny that it requires. And as such, I would ask Paul McNeill not to move Amendment 70 and to await the forthcoming work coming out of the VNS review. Thank you. And I call Pauline McNeill to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 75. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In winding up um, on the amendment and this group, there is no difference of opinion between any of the parties and the Cabinet Secretary on the importance of victim notification. So that's not the question here. Um, I totally acknowledge um, what the Cabinet Secretary said in relation to, to, to my amendments and how it might otherwise have been amended differently, but I think we would have taken the same approach to it. I think it's important to recognise that what Russell Findlay and myself uh, are trying to achieve in this group is, is to really highlight that it's the system itself which is failing many, many victims. Now, the um, Cabinet Secretary said, yeah, in reality, Yes, you can contact the Procurator Fiscal Service, you can ask these questions, but anyone who has ever tried to phone the Fiscal Office, even an MSP, knows how difficult it is. And by the way, I've had this conversation with the Lord Advocate, who said it's one of the things that she'd like to change about the system. I once wrote to the Glasgow Fiscal and said, is there any chance you could call me? Because there's absolutely no possible chance I can get in touch with you because your phone system is totally inaccessible. I'll take a... Russell Finlay. I wonder if the member shares my frustration that as we examined this bill at stages one and two, we didn't have the same level of detailed response that has now been provided by the Cabinet Secretary at stage three, when it's too late in the day to meaningfully address what we're trying to do. Y yes, I, I acknowledge that there's a lot of big issues, particularly in part two, that we have to come on to. There are huge policy areas, and all of which we all have the best of intentions to change. Um, this bill is not out of the scope of this bill to, to discuss it. Uh, what I would plead with the Cabinet Secretary for, um, this piece of work that's referred to, um, it is obviously not enough just to have law, and I recognise even if you supported it, it's, it's the system itself. It needs, it needs to be fit for purpose. We need to know that an, if we have a notification scheme, victims will be notified. And I also do recognise that 
It may not be in every single case that a victim needs to know, but in serious cases of bail and whether bail appeals, I did think there was on omission in relation to bail appeals, um, because I, I, well, um, I, I would probably stand corrected, but it doesn't seem to be provision for notification where someone who's been remanded to custody and subsequently is successful in their appeal as to whether or not they should be notified. Uh, however, I raised it for that very reason to make sure, yes, I'm happy to take care. I'm grateful to Ms McNeill. Pardon me, President Officer. Um, really, just to point to um, that some of the, the recommendations in the VNS review um, are uh, making some very uh, interesting points around automatic referrals as well, which might be of interest. Pauline McNeill. Yes, absolutely. I think we are all interested in making the administration of this much, much better than it already is, and I think the Parliament is at one. However, I'm still proposing to move my amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Mr Balfour, I am pleased to confirm that your vote has indeed been recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 75 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes 50, no 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Um, as announced previously, we will move to a comfort break just now for 10 minutes or so. So back around 10 to, but the division bell will ring to advise that we're about to recommence. <laughs> 